Beijing, ancient capital, modern metropolis, the home of emperors, and the heart of a great cultural tradition. Beijing, old and sedate, young and dynamic, a modern open city on the fast track to reinventing itself. Beijing, where two worlds mingle. Being Beijing is experiencing the life, seeing the sights, sampling the culture. That's being Beijing. Hi, welcome to Travelog. I'm Mark Edwards, and I'm here at Dersheng Gate. Now, back in the day, this was the place where, on the extreme edge of Beijing, step outside of these gates, and technically, you're outside of the city. Now, throughout the series, we focus on things to do and places to see within the city walls. But in the final episode for the next half hour, I'm going to hopefully show you what you need to go and check out on the outskirts of Beijing. Enjoy. Beijing is the political, educational, and cultural center of China. Split into districts, the capital city today stretches far beyond its city walls into what are called its counties. By the gates, located at the edge of what used to be the city proper, there are transport hubs from where eager Beijingers and tourists can set out for destinations within Beijing as well as around its outskirts. Back in the past, each of these gates served its own particular function. It was through Dersheng Gate, for instance, that victorious troops made their return to the city, while Anding Gate was where they set out on expeditions. I was doing things a little backwards by heading out of Dersheng Gate to go and explore some of the gems to be found on the outskirts of the city. Maybe I'd somehow return victorious through Anding Gate, or simply be happy with some astute tourism. So I've driven out about an hour outside the centre of Beijing to the Tanjie Se, the oldest temple in this region of China. So old, in fact, that they actually say, first came the Tanjie Temple, then came Beijing. Situated 45 kilometres west of Beijing, Tanjie Temple is the largest of all of Beijing's temples, with a history of over 1,600 years. It is one of the most important holy sites in the capital. Tourists and religious folk slowly and peacefully make their way together up a delightful climb amongst the trees to reach the temple. This place is a must-see for anyone with a love of Chinese temples and dramatic mountain scenery, or even if you're just looking for a chance to relax in a peaceful environment. That said. Try and avoid coming here on the first and the fifteenth days of the lunar month, as that's when the temple is overflowing with people coming to worship and burn incense. Unless, of course, big crowds are your thing. Personally, I was quite happy visiting on another day when the crowds were sparse, and I was able to lethargically take in the sights. It really is an ideal day trip if you want to get away from the hustle and bustle of a big cosmopolitan city like Beijing. And spending some time in Tanjie Temple or its tea house in particular helps to reinforce this feeling. It's just so peaceful here. Whether you come to pray or simply to fulfil your role as a budding culture vulture, you will find that the trees and flowers in and around Tanjie Temple are worth the price of admission alone. 35 RMB, if you're wondering. An excellent time to visit the Tanjie Temple is around mid-April, when the magnolias are in bloom, yielding beautiful blossoms of white. Yellow and purple. It takes about an hour and a half to get from Tanjie Temple to Chuan Di Xia. Originally called Chuan Di Xia, meaning under the stove, this tiny village of around a hundred souls is an ideal two-day trip for those with a passion for Chinese vernacular architecture. Although it's keen for a glimpse of life in rural China, nestled in a valley some 90 kilometers west of Beijing and overlooked by towering peaks, Chuan Di Xia is a gorgeous cluster of courtyard homes and old-world charm. 
There are even signs in Chinese and English on the floor to point you in the right direction. Okay, so here in Tuan Di Xia, you will see this character extremely often scattered around the village. Now, Tuan Di Xia stands for under the stove, and the first character is the stove character, which you can see here. Now, that's the literal translation, and you should never really literally translate anything, because in Chinese, the character is extremely meaningful. We have four characters within the one character. Now, this is testing my own research, and uh, please don't call me up on this, but we do have fire here, huo, which is uh, surrounded by a big fire, da huo, uh, and that's, uh, above that we can find a forest, uh, or wood, in lin, so we have fire with a forest, and above that, xing, meaning sort of thriving. So the whole of the character is, it has a very good Chinese meaning of prosperity, so that there's prosperity across the village. So much better meaning in Chinese. Chuan Di Xia boasts some of the best preserved Seho Yuan, or courtyard houses, in the Beijing area. It was open to tourism in 1997. Steeped in a history of over 500 years, it was blissfully relaxing to wake up early and walk around this historic village completely undisturbed. It really has the feel of a place that is completely untouched by time. You can lose yourself amongst the narrow alleyways that snake their way around this hillside hamlet. The area is a magnet for artists, poets and period drama camera crews. The look and feel of the village is ideal for imbuing artists and poets with the inspiration to pen or paint some creative magic. This in turn works for the TV and film industry who don't need to fork out major sums of money on designing expensive traditional Chinese sets when the entire village is, in itself, already preserved just as they want it. Even some Chinese blockbusters such as Warlords, starring Jet Li and Andy Lau, have used this tiny hamlet as a setting for their film. I thoroughly recommend spending the night in Chuan Di Xia. You won't find any five-star hotels here, but the local food is great, the people are friendly, and with most lodgings offering basic accommodation at around 15 RMB per night, you'd be hard-pressed to find better value for money for such a unique, one-off experience. Hey buddy. Surrounded by dogs today. Uh, I finally arrived at the highest restaurant in uh, Tsun Di Xia. And it's coincidentally the, the hotel as well that I stayed in last night. Very cheap and comfortable. This is something that caught my mind uh, earlier on when I was heading out. And uh, I asked what it was, and it's in fact a menu, a Chinese menu. So we have uh, all the dishes are made locally. And uh, we have, uh, I think someone told me this one was uh, meat. Uh, one of them is, yeah, that's fish, that's character for fish, and then uh, cheeseburger, milkshake, and fries. Is that one? Uh, no idea, can't really read them. But don't be worried in case you feel like you can't uh, read any of those characters and you're going to be eating random foods. They do have a menu in English, so uh, I don't need to pretend to know what I'm eating. But I've got to say, this is a perfect place to chill out, relax, have a cup of tea. It's very kindly of being brought to me. And just uh, check out the view. Cheers. The Ming tombs are situated around 50 kilometers northwest of Beijing and are the final resting place of 13 out of the 16 Ming emperors. It might not be your idea of fun trekking out of Beijing to visit an imperial necropolis, 
But I guarantee that the more intellectual travellers amongst you will love the Confucian layout and design. Not that I class myself in that category in any way. If anything, it's another example of how peaceful some of the sites outside of Beijing can be. I had a great time strolling around the long gardens, checking out the tombs and the intricate animal statues scattered around the place. Are beginning to open up in Beijing, and for those happy to accept that laziness on holiday is not a sin, you'll be glad to hear that the majority of these come with a driver. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy the Beijing countryside. That said, don't worry if you're driving on your own. There are maps available with both English and Chinese place names. It is a beautiful day today. The sun is shining and the sky is blue, and it's a perfect time to take a little trip outside of Beijing, which is what I've done. I'm an hour and a half outside, and I'm here in Huairo District. A great place to check out. There's plenty of things to do. Firstly, if you want to just relax, you come down to Yangtze Lake. Take a little uh, chill, chill session there. A uh, bit of culture. You can go and check out the Hong Luo Temple, or do what I'm doing right now, and that's coming to the home of the Red Lantern. I'm in Hong Niao, and I'm going to see how those things are done. So, uh, and maybe even try and make one myself. Let's go check it out. Hong Niao is actually a tiny village located right by the Huanghua part of the Great Wall. So you can head there afterwards. Right, I've just been told there are 50 families uh, that uh, live in this little village, and each and every single one of them has something to do with the making of the Red Lantern. And this is where the magic happens. Let's go and have a look. In Hong Miao, you can come and buy your individual red lanterns, or even make one yourself as I did. Despite getting glue all over my hands and generally looking as though I was born with no dexterity whatsoever, the experience of making my own lantern was fully worth the short stop on my way to Huairo's Rainbow Trout Valley. Well, there are definitely advantages to the job of being a travel presenter, and heading out to Beijing's Rainbow Trout Valley to enjoy some delicious fish. Sample the vibrant nightlife and try out some of their many activities is certainly one of them. As a weekend getaway with friends, or simply a chance to romance that special someone in an idyllic location, the valley has it all. You can find rustic courtyards with barbecue pits, mountain villas, countryside hotels, as well as various styles of ranches nestling among green hills and blue waters. Let me warn you, though, this place is as popular at weekends as it is calm during the week. So I'm uh, I'm here at Exploring Valley, and uh, and uh, the great thing about this place is they have uh, lots of different activities for you to do uh, to keep yourself entertained during the day. And uh, we have uh, rock climbing, uh, horse riding, archery, paintballing, amongst other things. And I've decided to do some rock climbing to work up a little bit of a hunger uh, before dinner. Plus, I get to wear these cool mountain rock climbing nappies. I don't think that's the technical term, by the way, but they're pretty cool anyway. So uh, I'm going to go up the easy slope first, and then hopefully try the other one later. Take some sun in. Ooh. 
Let's go and check out the place. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Nice, nice. Get myself a free coke. Uh, oh, let's have a look at this. Tiring day, tiring day. Now, uh, this is one of the perks of the job, is I get my own place for the night. And uh, a place like this would set you back at the weekends at about uh, 1,200 kwai. Uh, there's two bedrooms, and so about four people can stay here. And during the week, it goes down to 700. So, mm. go check out the rooms. Uh, I'm going to go with this one. Oh, bed. <laughs> Sorry. Let's. You gotta go. You gotta go. I'm gonna go for a snooze. See you later. Romance is arguably top of a lot of people's priorities. But as everyone knows, the true way to a man's heart is via his stomach. Or maybe that's just me. Anyway, the real stars of this place are the trout. Don't worry if you haven't brought your fishing gear. You can still handpick your fish at all the restaurants. I just love the atmosphere here. Everyone is in really good spirits. Okay. This is the bit that I've been waiting for all day. I love the, 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 the rock climbing. Uh, a bit tiring, but now we have a chance to uh, unwind, relax. I'm in Quairo in the, uh, an area called the Trout Valley, uh, an area that never sleeps. It's a party town, and everyone comes here to uh, have some food, have a lot of drinks, and just, uh, you know, have a good time. I'm here, I'm joined by a few, uh, a few friends, and uh, is, is this your first time here? No, I've come here many times. Really? Yeah. Why? It's such a beautiful place. What would you guys recommend uh, in terms of food? Because I don't really know what to eat. So. Climbing is always the favourite food. Like leg. Oh, it's got me beer. Oh, cheers. <laughs> With your belly full, your head a little light from the dozens of beers, and safe in the knowledge that Rainbow Trout Valley has enhanced your reputation as a modern day Romeo, you have to head to the Great Wall. Much like taking in the Ming tombs after Chuan Di Xia, you do need to mix up the hidden treasures with the more famous sites. And this one you don't, and quite literally won't be able to miss. It's my favorite in and around Beijing, and it really is China's mandatory must-see site. With a history of over 2,000 years, in its heyday, it was guarded by more than a million men. It's been estimated that somewhere in the region of 2 to 3 million people died as part of the project of building the wall. The closest section of the Great Wall to Rainbow Trout Valley is Mu Tianyu, situated roughly 70 kilometers northeast of Beijing. It's one of the best preserved parts of the Great Wall, and one that I find is the most friendly for all ages. By this, I mean that there is a cable car to take you up and down if you're feeling a tad unfit, as well as a toboggan down to keep the younger generations happy. You could, of course, bypass any of these and make your own way up and down on foot if you're feeling slightly more adventurous. It's pretty, uh, it's pretty tiring just walking up here. Make sure you bring lots of water with you. Oh, what a sight. I really like the Great Wall. Yeah? How great is the Great Wall, would you say? <laughs> the Great Wall. Is it great? Is it great? <laughs> it's very great. Yeah. It's a very great wall. Well, the greatest part so far has definitely been the cable car, though, for these guys. So Yeah, the yeah. cable car coming up the Great Wall is exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, how do you feel about coming to the Great Wall? Oh, it feels very good. It's uh, enough some fresh air. It's yeah. different from Cambodia. And uh, visiting the wall, which is a child, uh, child dream. Childhood dream. Accomplishing today. Yeah. It's nice. I'm here at the gate of the Mutenyu Pass, 
And this is, in fact, where the generals would allow people in and out. Now, on our right, uh, we have where the Mongols are being kept at bay, and on our left is where the Han are. This is also the point where they would have the two groups uh, doing trade and business together. Mu Chen Yu is also famous for having crenulated parapets on both sides of the wall, so that shots could be fired at the enemy, keeping people at bay on all sides. There are two different gradients of the wall, depending on which part you decide to take on. If you enjoy a good sweat, take the right side out of the cable car, and you can work those calf muscles up the steeper part of Mu Chen Yu. For a more relaxed climb, head left. You'll still be able to sleep soundly that night, but without so much need to shower when you get home. To get there, take number 916 or number 936 bus at Dongjiman Gate. Get off at Huairo Longshan Hotel and take a mini bus to the wall. So I'm here at the Da Jiao Lo, which literally means big corner building. It would have meant the end of one of the army zones, but it also happens to be the end of the repaired section of Mu Chen Yu at the Great Wall. Now, as a tourist, I'm not allowed to go past into the unrepaired section, but uh, I'll just hang in the doorway and have a look. If you'd prefer to feel as though you've got the Great Wall all to yourself, Head to Sumatai. It's situated 120 kilometers northeast of Beijing. Hanging precariously onto Yanshan Mountain, it is known for its steepness, ingenuity, and uniqueness. It really is a totally different experience to Mu Qianyi. More serene, but also much harder work. Not for the lazy. Well, I was up at the crack of dawn this morning so that I could try and enjoy uh, this part of the Great Wall almost all to myself. Now, Sumatai is not as famous as its more illustrious cousins, uh, Badaling and Mu Chen Yu. However, that doesn't mean you should miss out on it. I personally think this is the uh, most well-kept part of the Great Wall in that it seems to have a lot less uh, refurbishment or a lot less repairs. Now, we're right on the border of uh, Hebei province on my right and Beijing on my left. But I've got to warn you, it's more of a tip. Um, when you come to Sumatai, it's the hardest part of the Great Wall to climb uh, because it's the steepest and tallest. So uh, be sure to pack some uh, seriously solid hiking boots. Whew. There are many parts of China's Great Wall, each one completely different from another and with different things to see and do. Having had a chance to visit a few, I can safely say that each is an attraction in itself. Whether you come in winter or summer, there is a different feeling at each section. I pride myself on being a good sleeper and needing lots of it. But visiting a place such as Simatai, the earlier you get up, the better. Strolling along this part of the Great Wall before the rest of the world is awake was truly an incredible experience for me. Surrounded by early morning mist, with only your thoughts as company, you feel so much closer to nature and are overpowered by the magnificence of this wonderful structure. I can only imagine what it would be like during the winter snow. Despite being a fair distance from Beijing, I thoroughly recommend sleeping over at Sumatai so you can enjoy the sunrise and sunset here. the top Woo. but uh, it's time to get a little sad because unfortunately that is all the time we've got left and we're wrapping up the Beijing series as a whole now I really hope you've enjoyed your tiny little taste 
of what this wonderful city has to offer. From the tall skyscrapers and hustle and bustle of the central business district, right down to the traditional quiet courtyard houses in Hohai, without forgetting the wonderful food, obviously. But above all, I really hope that we've been able to give you an insight into how quickly this city is changing, evolving and modernising while still retaining its traditions and culture for future generations to enjoy. I'm Mark Edwards and I'll see you very soon on another episode of Travel Log.